Hello and welcome to the Game Week 8 edition of the FPL Skull Podcast. I am one of your hosts, Matthias, and with me today I have, as always, Kevin with me. Kevin, you're back in London after a nice little visit in Oslo. We did make a video together on uh, on Monday, which you can check out on the on the channel if you want to. But now you're safely back in, in London and there has been some, some th- things happening. We've had some Champions League games. We have You're currently in the middle of some Europa League and Conference League games. We're recording this in between like the first few games and the second uh, batch of games. Uh, so Aston Villa and Liverpool, for example, are about to kick off uh, as we speak right now, or have just kicked off right as we speak now. Um, but speaking of Liverpool, there have been some controversy around uh, the whole uh, VAR goal taken away Liverpool against Spurs last weekend. We obviously watched the game together and we sort of like talked about it back then. But now it seems like there is kind of a new backlash towards Liverpool and people are thinking that they are kind of out of bounds in saying that they should have a replay of the match. They think Klopp is kind of like taking it too far. And like asking for a rematch and stuff. Um, so, what are your whole thoughts about the whole like the decision that happened, and also like the the thing afterwards? Like, what's your current like thinking in terms of uh, what they should do with what happened? Is there really a big problem still? Um, yeah, what what do you think about the whole situation? Yeah, I mean, my take on this is that Klopp is a butthurt manager. <laughs> I completely understand why he's upset over. The decisions that were made but i think it fundamentally needs to change there that's where things need to really uh be highlighted because all things considered have you heard the leaked like the audio yeah it's pretty pretty bad like i don't think the <laughs> solution should then be oh we should just get to replay matches because that is just going to be a waste of time and etc so i think fundamentally that's what needs to be changed and i hope that you know, they can reverse things like that. I don't understand how that would be so difficult for them to implement. That's like, actually, mate, it's outside or it's a goal, simple as. But, you know, apparently it'll ruin the flow of the game and et cetera, but it's already ruined the flow of the game considering they're having to wait there for like five minutes waiting for a line to be drawn or to this to be done and et cetera. So I think the ability to reverse decisions like that should should be available yeah especially something as blatant as that uh yeah on site call was yeah that's pretty much my thoughts as well i think i i don't think this is going to be an issue going forward i think they're going to change the way they, they speak they're going to say decision confirmed offside like just add that little bit of context to the whole thing and you you basically get away from the mistake that they did this time around mm-hmm. and then you have the other potential option which is the semi-automatic offsides we basically have a machine do it for you and it seems like that works just better it's quicker it's more accurate i can't really see any reason why they wouldn't add that for especially next season but maybe even in this season already but but yeah i don't think it's that big of a deal i don't think it's going to happen that much uh, going forward obviously it sucks for liverpool that it happened this time and it sucks for us as uh, solo owners in fl and we didn't get that assist uh but yeah i don't think it's that big of an issue and i do think they should be able to like sort of make changes even after the game has started again but i don't think it should be just for like those factual like okay we actually got one decision wrong it's just like a matter of fact like an offside decision like that i don't think like if they get a new angle and then they decide to go with a penalty like five minutes after they have decided not a penalty i don't think they should go that route so i think they need to be a bit careful about the language if they're going to change the rules so that they can intervene if something like this happens again um so that they don't have like penalties given like five minutes after because it's already taxing enough to to be worried about penalties going against you but then at least you get the decision but but yeah there should be some way for them to intervene when they've realized that they've actually made a mistake like they did this time and they should be able to just go into the game again and, and fix it but like i said i don't think it's going to be that big of an issue and i don't think it's going to be i don't know i think i think it's just yeah, it's kind of just uh, done and dusted now. Don't really have to think about it anymore. I don't think it's going to happen again. Similarly, there have been some other instances of like offsides where you can't see the player who's offside, for example, or where they've made the mistake of uh, not checking the correct player in terms of the offside as well. There are some issues like that, but yeah. I know you, you know my, my whole thoughts about VAR. I want it to be scrapped, <laughs> preferably, but if they don't scrap it i hope they just like fix it and make it better cuz cuz it could be so much better i think we all can agree about that that so far it is not working as as intended at least and they could make it a lot better but we're not really here to talk about var and, uh, and stuff like that we're here to talk about fpl 
and there's plenty to talk about so let's just go straight into it and look at your team for this past game week 51 points you made two transfers you did a minus four hit to sell chill to Trippier, but that was a really a decision in the end for you because Trippier got 12 points he got a pretty lucky assist but then he got the bonus points as as expected and got the clean sheet as well as expected for for newcastle in that second really fav favorable fixture in a row so just in general how do you feel about your game week 51 points um decent game week ish i guess um what do you think about the game week in general Hold on, missing so many chances is starting to piss me off and uh, it's clearly affecting him because not only do we see him screw up in the league, he also screwed up in midweek in the Champions League where it was Doku, uh, Alvarez and Foden that had to uh, bail City out and he was just missing chance after chance and Leipzig uh, is one of his favorite opponents in terms of goal scoring records and stuff like that so you know, it's everything that could go wrong for him did. And the thing is, it doesn't really matter considering that we all captain him or yeah. he's got such effective ownership. But it does make me question, um, you know, uh, what my plans are for next week as we'll get to maybe um, if I will take him out because, spoiler alert, I will be doing a free hit. Um, but other than that, like, I can't really complain. I really kept a clean sheet. For six points, trip here, got twelve points. Berninho, the greatest uh, FPL asset of uh, mankind, uh, got a clean sheet as well. And I promise you, Sterling would have gotten a brace in that game against Fulham yeah. if he wasn't ill. It's really frustrating that he that came on and got a yellow card. So it was pretty pointless that he uh, was even starting for me. But of course, how could we know this going in? Um, Bruno Fernandes has been really frustrating, but he came very close again. That's the thing with yeah. Bruno uh, throughout, even in the Champions League game, he probably should have scored uh, mm. had Rashford put it better uh, or given him a better pass. So yeah. I'm not, I feel a little bit hard down by with Salah as well. Um, but other than that, I can't really complain considering the fact that um, Estupinian is lucky not to have got even more minus, uh, <laughs> but then he got injured. So yeah, this, you know, as Gattuso says, sometimes maybe good, sometimes maybe shit. And that's kind of how I feel about this game week. Yeah, I think it was a pretty decent game week for you. I had 35 points myself, so I'm, I'm pretty unhappy. I didn't have any of the Newcastle defenders or the Ariola and goal situation either. So you got a lot of points there. And your other transfer as well was also kind of successful with Mbwemo to Gordon. Mbwemo blanked again. He doesn't look good at all currently. And Gordon got an assist. He did get a... Uh, yellow card so he has to be suspended for the next game week and that's partly why you're now doing a, a free hit for this upcoming game week but going forward i think gordon is going to be a pretty good pick like he seems like he's going to be pretty nailed for a really good newcastle team that beat psg 4-1 in the Champions league i could not see that coming at all so i was very surprised about that but yeah gordon looks good all their newcastle assets look pretty good going forward even though they fight they faced the mighty west ham in the next game week so i get why you're free hitting and selling them all uh that, that makes sense for me but, but yeah Let's move on to Kimo, our third founding member of the FPL Scope. He ended up with 54 points. He also did the chill well to trip move. Didn't even have to do a minus four to do it. And that worked out really well for him. Uh, he also had Saka for nine points and Alvarez for eight points. And he also had Son, who we didn't have, who scored against Liverpool as well. Um, but yeah. Um, he is also using a chip this game week, as, as a spoiler. He is using the wildcard chip, like many others are doing. Um, but looking at this team, do you think there's a reason why he used the wildcard chip, or would you just stay the course if you had, if you were in Kimo's position? You think? I mean, I think there was um, a lot of pressing things with some of the injury news, but I think it's also partial impatience. Uh, I, I know Kimo; he likes shaking things up quite a bit, uh, especially when he feels that things go stale. <laughs> So fair enough. I mean, this if there was a time to wild card, and if I ha I still had my wild card, you best believe I would have done it <laughs> for this week. And uh, and considering um, some of the stuff that tribulations that you've been going through with some of the price changes and stuff like that, I know you feel sort of the same in that regards. Um, but you have a strategy of where you want to hold it as long as you can, and that's fair enough. It's a legitimate strategy too. Um, I just don't. Um, yeah, I don't think it's such a negative thing for him to do the ball card. That being said, I really 
I think his team just ha- needed some few adjustments and uh, he would have been fine. But you know what? If you want to jump on the sort of form train of some of these teams, it makes perfect sense for him to uh, get rid of these <laughs> players. And of course, the uh, Egyptian guy who loves Egypt more than anything, to not have Mo Salah is a crime against humanity. So it makes sense that he also wants the wild card to try and get Salah in. Maybe. Whether he does, whether he does is a different story. And yeah. I will never respect him as an Egyptian if he doesn't. So um, we'll have to wait and see. But I think, generally speaking, it's a positive thing that he's, he's doing the wild card. Uh, you know, at least he's not doing it because he's... Um, a necessity or anything like that he's getting to do it sort of on his own terms and he'll feel more confident and happy with this team but hopefully he does some mistakes <laughs> yeah we'll see about this uh wildcard team pretty soon as well i think his team is pretty decent it's just the fact that he had pretty poor like backup options if he had done a little bit better job with the the backup options from the start of the season season i think it'd be fine but he has to pick for a situation which is not good Saliba has some difficult fixtures. Bayer is kind of a waste man now that the, the double game week is gone. Bolock is just constantly injured. Mabama doesn't play at all. Even in the Europa League, he doesn't even get to play. And Estepinan is obviously out for a while now. Mitoma has some tough matches. So there are enough issues here to to do a wildcard. So I, I sort of understand why Kimo has, has pulled the plug or, or pulled the... I always say, always say that. Pull the trigger. Pull the plug is sort of like give up. But yeah. Uh, pull the trigger here uh, <laughs> and, and do the wildcard. Also getting rid of the Rashford as well, who's, who looks pretty bad, and Saka potentially being injured. There's plenty of reasons to do wild card, so I, I understand it from Kimo's point of view. But we'll get to his wild card pretty soon. Decent game for him as well, 54 points. The 12 Trippier points, really good for him. He is really high on, on Trippier and trying to make me get Trippier as well. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, uh, that would be fun to talk with him about as well. Hopefully we can get him back on the podcast at some point uh, pretty soon for a little cameo. Because we miss talking to him here on the podcast and talking about FPL. Even though we do it quite a lot in the group chat we have on whatsapp but yeah either way let's move on to the final score of the the week that we're going to look at and that is the manager of the week and you can also be the manager of the week you guys watching kevin can obviously be the manager of the week as well if you become the highest scoring player in our fpl scope mini league but any of you guys watching you can add or join the mini league at the league code v9jt0d and if you get the highest score of one particular game week, you'll be you'll be featured on the podcast, and we'll talk about your score and your future plans. So this team also has uh, the same sort of defense as you, with Trippier and Burn and Ariola defensively, but offensively is where the big bucks are being made. With Carlton Morris as the captain, Ollie Watkins with his twenty three points, which is obviously going to be the part of the manager of the week squad this week, because Watkins was the standout performer this, this game week. But what's interesting about this team is I haven't actually added it in the yeah. Um, what's interesting about this team is that this guy actually used a wild card for this game week, and he has wild carded out Holland. There is no Holland in this team, which obviously worked out game good for this game week. But it's going to be interesting to see what's going to happen going forward. So, looking at this as like a new wild card team for game week seven, would you have done anything differently? Because obviously. Worked out really well this week, but going forward, do you think this is, this team has some issues going forward, or do you think it's a solid team going forward as well? No, there's obviously aspects of the team that does work, and obviously reflected in the fact that he got almost a hundred points. But um, I think it's really ballsy to go without um, Holland because we all know that he's a monster, and just at any minute he can turn it on. So, and I think Morris is one of those sort of short sighted. Um, picks. I mean, obviously it worked out 20 points and 10 points without captaincy is very decent from a player from uh, who got very lucky to score against Everton, but um, generally speaking, I think the team is uh, looking good, especially the fact that he must have then brought in Watkins, which uh, you know, crazy good luck as well for the 23 points. I like all some of these picks. I like uh, Oni I like Evans because I think uh, he'll get a little bit more playtime now with um, Licha. Uh, Martinez basically being out, Sunder Martinez being injured for a bit, and uh, Adogi, who I regret selling, but at the same time, you know, for Berninho worked out and all this type of stuff, who he also has. So a lot of this team I'm very uh, jealous about, and uh, it looks good, but. Man, the big Norwegian-shaped uh, 
hole. hole in his attack is just a bit <laughs> disgusting, to be honest. I, I think that's going to really come back to bite him. Yeah, we'll talk more about his uh, his future plans as well and whether we should bring or whether we would bring in Holland back through transfers or if we wait a couple game weeks, we're going to discuss that when we look at his team for the next game week as well. But yeah, like I said, you can be the manager of the week as well if you join the mini league, so, so please do that. We have, uh, I think it's about 150, 200 people or something in the league right now. It would be nice to have even more people and, and have the we- the league become one of the best leagues in the world because I think we have the abil- ability to, go- to get there. <coughs> Sorry, my voice is a bit cracking up and stuff, so yeah, hopefully you can bear with me. But either way, let's move on to our uh, result predictions for this past game week. And it wasn't the best game week. I had four correct results out of ten. You had five. And we also have one scoreline correct each. But looking at these fixtures, uh, what was the one fixture that really surprised you? And what was the one fixture where you feel really good about your prediction, even if you didn't get it correct? So the one that obviously shocked me was the fact that Wolves didn't get spanked like we both (laughs) considered that they would. uh, Even to the point where we both went that they wouldn't score, which is a bit of a a piss take, uh, just uh, similar to what Pep said about that Korean guy. Um, because w- in previous results, we've always said Wolves has the ability to score against anyone, and they've just been really unlucky. And finally, they sort of rolled the luck and got some decent um, return in the fact that they got three points against the Premier League champs. So obviously that one was a was a big, big shock. Um, and I can see why people are starting to get a bit scared of Holland, but don't be don't be stupid. Don't be manager of the week, even though that is exactly what you want to be. Um, and regards to um, one that was sort of almost there, um, yeah, I think it's uh, for me personally. Um, I think it might have been the Fulham Chelsea one. I think we were both being a bit too generous to uh, Fulham in regards to them scoring because we we've been hating on Fulham all season long, and we're like, nah, because this is London derby, they'll probably score. And because Chelsea um, were um, playing pretty terribly, but uh, kudos to them, they looked really good, and uh, I liked what I saw of a lot of the different assets. But then again, it's fucking Fulham, so. For me, I think the most like the result where I think it should have been probably closer to what we predicted is the Spurs Liverpool game because I think sure. either yeah. a draw or a Liverpool win would was probably on the cards there. It's just Liverpool got kind of screwed with both referee decisions when it comes to the goals and potentially the red cards as well. I think both red cards yeah. were kind of harsh. Could have been yellow. Um, both of them just one yellow for for Jota and, and potentially a yellow for. Um, for Jones as well, but that decision has been upheld, by the way. Uh, so he's getting his three-match ban as well, Curtis Jones, for the tackle he he made. Uh, so I, th- I think Spurs kind of can consider themselves a bit lucky there. They didn't even create that much, even with 11 against 9, which is also interesting to see. So I think Spurs have been pretty lucky to get uh, the four points that they got from the Arsenal and Liverpool games, uh, personally. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I totally agree with you with the shock result of the week being Wolves against Man City. We both had, <laughs> I had 4 nil from Man City, you had 3 nil from Man City. So very unexpected there. But Wolves have shown that they can do it against the bigger, bigger sides. That's something that we actually talked a bit, bit about as well, that they do have some decent results or decent performances at least. Not results, but decent performances against Man United and Liverpool so far this season. But yeah, that's pretty much the results from this past game week. You have a healthy 10 match lead on me in terms of the correct results. And you also have two more correct score lines as well for this whole season so i need to catch up and um that's what i'm hoping to do for this uh, upcoming game week where like i noted when you sent me the the, the results the uh, predictions you don't think there's going to be a single clean sheet this game week which is uh, kind of interesting a lot of ones every single game has a one some of them even have two ones uh, in it so looking at these results on a whole um compared to <laughs> just like uh, each and every game do you think it's likely that it's not going to be a single clean sheet and every team is going to score at least one goal. I must have been really tired when I sent this uh, because I have no idea why I said that. Including the Everton game, I think we could easily keep a clean sheet against Bournemouth considering how misfiring they've been. So, yes, um, I think with uh, 
like Luton, uh, I'm banking on Morris getting some bullshit penalty just to be like, oh, FPL troll scoring again. Um, other than that, I kind of back everything that I've uh, kept otherwise because I think, yeah, like I think a lot of these teams will concede. But um, potentially that Crystal Palace, Nottingham Forest, no, no, looks like a tasty result for you as well. We both think it's going to be a draw, but uh, I thought they both could score. But I also did, uh, I think I didn't know as it was injured, which like for me completely removes a goal from Crystal Palace. So, but yeah, you know, um, fuck it, we go. Yeah, to your credit though, or to your, uh, as a, like a, uh explanation potentially this game week i think is pretty even across the board apart from luton spurs which is obviously pretty uh, lopsided towards spurs and potentially also liverpool against brighton the rest of the games are pretty even like fulham and sheffield united are both really bad arsenal and man city are both really good um west ham and newcastle can both get really good results against anyone really so i think it's a pretty even game week in in general so i think it's a really tough game week to predict potentially, but seeing as I um, as I've struggled so far this season, um, yeah, I, I, I'm hoping I can get some more good results in in this game week compared to what I've had the past few game weeks. But yeah, uh, looking at these game, games, so which games are you looking forward to the most, and which games are you the most unsure about when it comes to the result? Do you think? Uh, looking forward to the most is obviously <laughs> means. Very obvious with Arsenal Man City, but I think Brighton Liverpool can be really fun too. Um, I think Brighton need to really show um, sort of that um, consistency that they've shown throughout, but lately it's been sort of, yeah, I don't know. Like, I'm not saying to Sarah be out, and I'll probably never say that, but like in regards to just the fact that they've been a little bit inconsistent, I think this could be a fun way for them to show that obviously like last couple of results have been a bit fluky especially the fact that they conceded as many as they did i think it's you brilliantly said it was similar to the everton game where they just seemingly just gave up and just wrote the game off onto the next one sort of thing so i think that's going to be a really fun game too um in regards to my own everton i think finally this could be the game where we get a home win even though i I've felt this way for a long time with a bunch of the games we've had at home. So hoping the game we won last time out, last home game we technically won in the Premier League, uh, I hope is the one that we need to get Goodison Park rocking again. Yeah, fair enough. I also think Everton have a pretty good chance of winning. I think Bournemouth has sort of gone, gone under the radar as a pretty poor team so far. It seems like Areola needs more time to get his team settled. I think the thing with Ariola, he has some really good results with Rayo Vallecano in, in La Liga, but he started off in La Liga 2, like the, the second division, Segunda División, as it used to be called at least. Um, so he got to like get his team in line against easier opposition before he played against the big boys. But now he has been like sort of thrown into it with a pretty weak Bournemouth squad who have a lot of new signings that are interesting, but most of those signings have been sort of injury-prone as well and injured so far. So, so yeah, I think Everton can definitely get a result from that game. So yeah, I think Everton is potentially a team like looking at you and your free hit. I think the Everton game is potentially some somewhere where you can lean on Everton targets, and I think that would be really nice for you as well as an Everton fan. You can look for for one of the one or two potential good Everton differentials. Obviously, the Spurs match is somewhere where you can look at Spurs players. That's part of the reason why you've uh, used the free hit because you didn't have a, didn't have a single Spurs asset. So I think that makes sense as well. But also, I think Brentford against Man United is a really interesting game. I have 2-2 two, two for, for, for this game. Two goals for Man United, two goals for Brentford. You have 2-1 to Man United. But both these teams have kind of struggled lately. But Brentford do have some pretty good results against uh, good opposition the past few seasons. So what do you think about this game in general? Like, which You obviously have a Man United narrow win, but if either team would win with, with like three goals or something, which team would that be, do you think? And, and do you think that has any chance of happening with both these teams struggling so so much going forward right now? No. And I, I think, um, I'll be completely honest. I, I think both teams are in complete <laughs> decline and uh, it's pretty embarrassing, especially for Man United to the point where Ten Hag is um, being considered for, you know, the sack and everything like that. And this is, you know, Manchester United, 
one of the biggest clubs in England and the world. Things can't continue like this. And for me, I liked a lot of what they did against Galatasaray, besides, of course, <laughs> losing. Uh, so, like, yeah, in regards to that, um, I did really like what I saw of Rasmus Hoyland. And that's why, you know, messaged you like, hey, maybe for a free hit, Rasmus Hoyland might uh, be someone to consider. Um, and I think they're they're showing a little bit of gel in terms of the attack. Whilst with Brentford, I think their attack is in complete disarray. I don't know what's happened. Like, and mm-hmm. Buemo's playing pretty much right wing back. Um, Wissa is just dog shit. I I I don't understand what happened to him. Maybe because I put him in my FPL team, he's like, <laughs> you know what? I'm gonna be complete shit from now on because he's missing these chances that he was bearing pretty early into the season and i've seen him score last season and stuff too so i don't know what's going on there and i think um unfortunately at this rate they're not going to be able to sort it out against a manchester united side who are already under fire under a lot of criticism and um scrutiny and a ten hog who could potentially get fired so for me i think this has to be where they get a win. It might be an narrow one because Brentford have had some good results against Man United, but um, I still think Man United will scrape through with a victory. Yeah. The next game I want to talk a little bit about is uh, Brighton-Liverpool because I think Brighton are sort of also kind of on the downturn. They're looking worse and worse, and now they're losing as the pinion, which is another huge thing for them. I think that was one of the big things with Brentford that they lost Rico Henry. It is only like a left back, but it could affect the team in major ways, as we've seen with Brentford. Um, so with this opinion injury and Brighton just looking a bit not so good, both against Aston Villa and also now against Marseille in the um, in the Europa League, even though they secured a 2-2 draw in the end there, they did concede two goals in the first half. And, and it's not looking that good in terms of uh, their Europa potential as well, especially compared to the mighty West Ham, who once again won in Europa and once again went unbeaten. For the 17th game in a row, I think. But yeah, speaking of Brighton, they've looked pretty beatable the last few, last couple of matches at least. And Liverpool, I think, are feeling pretty hard done by at this point. Obviously, we have the loss against the Spurs, really late loss against them. The decisions against them and just result in general against them so far the past few game weeks. So I think Liverpool, Brighton could potentially be one of those like majorly scoring games. I have 3-2 for Liverpool. I think it's going to be a pretty fun an open game. Brighton have obviously a lot of attacking talents. I think we both hope and potentially uh, might see an Ansu Fati goal against Liverpool, which would be really nice to see. Uh, but I think Liverpool has a pretty good chance of actually winning this by by quite a lot more than just the one goal that we both have. I have 3-2 for, Bright- for Liverpool against Brighton away, and you have 2-1 for Liverpool away to Brighton. Um, so what do you think about this match in general and, and this predict the result because obviously this was predicted before the Stupinan injury as well so how do you think the Stupinan injury affects Brighton and what do you make of Brighton as well after the loss against Aston Villa and now the loss or the draw against Marseille yeah I mean I, I really f- feel sorry for their strikers the most because you have people like Ferguson and uh, Juan Pedro who are <laughs> just constantly being rotated and both are scoring in different uh, capacities um, so yeah I don't know I, I think there's a bit too much rotation even uh, at this point. But that being said, I, I've liked what I've seen of uh, Tarek Lamptey. I think he had a pretty stellar game, uh, actually, um, from what I saw. Um, but, of course, uh, maybe he was terrible at uh, the beginning and etc. So, But that being said, there have been positives. Like you mentioned, they did rescue a last-minute draw. And... They are a completely different beast in, at the Amex compared to uh, away from home. Um, so for me, sure, they can ride it out, but the stupid young is a huge loss. I think he's a um, huge, huge loss because he, in like five minutes, can do more than some players like in the actual Brighton side can do in like 80. So it's going to be a huge loss and I think it's going to be the catalyst to why they lose. But that being said, Liverpool obviously have some issues with uh, Jota uh, being, it was Jota as well who got the red card. Jota suspended, yeah. yeah. 
and got and injured. Darwizzi just now missed the open, pretty much a sitter. Um, so, um, yeah, you know, Salah can, of course, write things through and et cetera. And I think defensively, Brighton are going to be a bit shaky and maybe give us a cheeky Salah pen. So, yeah, I still think it's going to be uh, a huge loss for Brighton with the stooping on out. And I think Liverpool will capitalize. And like you said, hard done by with the Spurs results. So they're going to look to bounce back. And I think this is going to be the way to do it. Yeah. And the next game I want to talk a little bit more about is uh, West Ham Newcastle. I have actually a 1 1 draw. I've actually backed West Ham for once. And I think it's partly down, like my, my prediction is partly down to Newcastle and having Gordon out with suspension, obviously with Barnes already injured, and then Botman injured as well. I think there are plenty of things to, to attack against uh, against Newcastle. And I think West Ham have looked so good this season. So kind of backing West Ham at home against Newcastle. You have a 3 1 win for Newcastle. But how do you see this game? Um, panning out in general and the other thing with West Ham which potentially might save us is the fact that Kellen Wilson is still a doubt for the game because he always scores against West Ham I know Isak scored last time against West Ham uh, when Newcastle thrashed us 5-1 but uh, but yeah I think it's going to be a pretty even game and I have pretty much a lot of faith in West Ham this season from what they've done so far but yeah why are we going with 3-1 here for Newcastle and how do you see this game playing out I mean I think what are the funnier things that we said in the podcast uh, since the beginning of the season when Newcastle were on the low is that they clearly needed something to change and that change has come they've been looking really good since obviously the 8-0 no win and um, it's just W after W after W after W I think Isak's been looking really great I think Miggy Almiron has yeah. looked really really good um, lately uh, obviously, Bernino scoring again uh, in the Champions League. So it's fun seeing um, Newcastle actually live up to the hype because a lot of us thought that they wouldn't be able to muster in the uh, group of death. And obviously, with the indication of how things were going in the league, you know, it made a lot of people feel justified in that having that position about Newcastle. But that being said, I've liked everything I've seen of them, especially considering it's the players that like the Miggy Almirons of the world that are stepping up. I think Anderson's looked great too. And I think um, like Fabian Schaar's goal. Oh my God, that's yeah. classic vintage Fabian Schaar. So um, yes, of course, this is in the Champions League against PSG and not Premier League opposition. Um, but that being said, you, you take these things into account and it does normally translate into the league as well. And I've been very impressed with everything they're doing they're in form they're looking hot um so yeah i think west ham drawing couldn't be the like most unrealistic result because west ham have been good at home i've liked james ward prowse paqueta a lot of the jared bowen obviously have been awesome for several weeks now and so i think it'll be a tightly contested game to begin with however i just something about newcastle lately <laughs> feels like they're just going to run away with it and especially if he sucks starts i'm sorry i think he's going to do some ice cold goal again yeah that could definitely happen but i'm pretty optimistic for, for for west ham for once and i think you could even get a get a win like a sneaky win potentially but i think a draw would be a good result either way for west ham and i think wouldn't be the worst results from Newcastle either away to West Ham. This is like one of their few tough fixtures in the like from game week six where they started playing in Sheffield United until like game week 13. I think they're pretty easy fixtures, but this is one of the ones that potentially is difficult. And we both expected them to concede this game as well without Botman and playing against West Ham who are so good at set pieces and have so many players that could score goals as well. And then the final game that I want to talk about is the big game out of the whole game week. The big game out of the whole like season probably as well. Arsenal at home to Man City. We've both gone with our different 2-1 suggestion. I have 2-1 for Arsenal. You have 2-1 for Man City. For me, it's down to City sort of showing some signs of... Um, I don't know, like some the opposite of signs of life. But they are showing some weaknesses now. Especially with Rodri out. I think that is sort of the catalyst for me going with Arsenal in this game. Easy to see this being a draw as well, but I think Arsenal will pull through. 
I think they need to show that they have actual league title aspirations. And this is the game to do it. Man City seemed to be there for the taking. Didn't really impress too much against Leipzig either. Lost against Wolves. Struggling without Rodri in the league in general. Rodri was obviously playing against Leipzig, which helped them. Um, so I think Arsenal will finally get the, the win here. Obviously, it's a bit dependent on if Saka plays or not. That's a major factor, because obviously he'd be an even bigger loss for Arsenal than Rodri is for Man City, probably. Uh, but I think Saka is going to be back and playing, because he was selected for the England squad, and I think he's going to be fine. And, you know, he always gets to play whenever he's, like, s- sort of slightly fit as well. So unless he gets an injury throughout the game, which could also happen, I think Arsenal will, will eke out the win here 2-1. But you going with two on Man City? Is it down to like what? What does that come down to really? Is it just the fact that they always beat Arsenal, or is it? Uh, yeah, I mean Arsenal are serial bottle jobs, and I also think, just generally speaking, I also just think City has more of what it takes to win these sort of games than I do with um, Arsenal. I think it's gonna. It obviously affected them that they didn't win the North London derby like they normally do. Um, obviously, the con- concerning loss against um, RC Lunds uh, plays a part in sort of my thinking there too. Uh, yes, I agree. Uh, City didn't look good against um, Wolves, but they turned things around against Leipzig, which is a stadium they tend to struggle at. And um, Doku is just looking on fire. Uh, Foden has been consistent this season comparatively, and. Uh, Julian Alvarez, man. I, I think he's going to be the difference maker. Uh, I say that before uh, Hola gets like five goals and it's like, remember me and all this type of shit. But Julian Alvarez is just completely playing out of his skin right now and is the saving grace of Man City. Uh, you know, I've, I called him the Argentinian David Villa for a reason because he's just so amazing with both feet and honestly, one of the best talents to be falling right now and i think he's going to play a big big difference in why they end up winning because compared to gabriel zeus who scored a great goal and all this type of stuff alvarez is just way more lethal and i think that's gonna eventually be the difference making because i think arsenal waste a lot of good chances i mean i say this as whole on to waste chances left and right currently but i think this is where he turns it on again he knows that this is where uh, it's ride or die in terms of the season as well because winning away from home um, will be huge because I think, without a doubt, they're like 80-20 when it comes to the Etihad, but um, they're more like... It's more 50-50 here uh, at the Emirates, so they got to make it count. I think they will. Yeah, fair enough. I'm, I think it's going to be an exciting game regardless of what happens, uh, obviously, between the two yeah. best teams in the league currently maybe they will have something to say about that but yeah really interesting game i think and uh and yeah one of the like the standout fixture uh that we have at, at this early start of the season at least but speaking of fixtures we can take a little bit of a look on the fixture ticker as well for the next few game weeks game week 8 until game week 12 the next five game weeks pretty much and out on top uh, in terms of the best fixtures going forward in the next five game weeks we have Spurs and we have Aston Villa number two and we actually have Man United number three, which is kind of surprising because most people are actually looking to sell Rashford and Bruno especially, but they do have some really good fixtures coming up. Um, but first, what I want to talk about more is uh, the captaincy decision because we've talked about Holland missing chances left and right quite a bit in this podcast and he's not going to be like the automatic captain each week now because you can see Man City are pretty close to the bottom of the list. They have pretty difficult fixtures. They do have Brighton at home and Bournemouth at home, which are pretty good fixtures. But Arsenal away, Man United away, Chelsea away. Three teams that, that they could struggle against potentially, especially away from home where they struggle a bit more to score than they do at home. Um, so looking at these fixtures, Game Week 8, Game Week 9, Game Week 10, Game Week 11, Game Week 12, who do you think is the optimal captaincy choice each Game Week if you go through Game Week by Game Week, starting with Game Week 8, looking at the fixtures, who would you choose as captain and then go forward each Game Week? Yeah, so I think uh, Game Week 8 can't ignore the Korean man anymore. Um, Kyung Min Sun, the other Korean guy, if you ask Pep. Um, so I think for Game Week 8, it's got to be him. I think for um, Game Week 9, um, it kind of stings to say, but I 
think you gotta say Mohamed Salah against us. Uh, we always get battered at um, Anfield, and yeah, I reckon he's gonna rip us a new asshole. Um, in terms of um, the game week ten options, Ollie Watkins, Diaby, if he's fit, I think that could be like a fun. Uh, cheeky differential. Mm. Obviously, we saw what happened last year in the derby um, when my man um, Holland got like three goals and two assists. So anything is possible there too. But if you're going completely on easiest fixtures, I also think Salah at home against Nottingham Forest could be a tasty option too. But I think I kind of have to... Um, yeah, I, I think Aston Villa at home... I guess losing could become another one of those 5 0 sort of yeah. famous wins for them. Um, what about Arsenal and Sheffield go- United? I get me 10. Suck is always an option, but yeah, I, I, for me, it remains to be seen how they handle um, City and uh, Chelsea. If Suck is fit, then of course, I think that's it. Sheff- at home against Sheffield United, you can 100% go for him or Edgard depending on which one's showing more signs of life. Um, but, yeah, for me, it just depends on how their rhythm is by then. Um, in game week 11, am I going to say Luton uh, at home against Liverpool? No, I would never say that. Um, I think the best, probably the best option there is uh, a City option. Bournemouth at home, yeah, hundred percent. You want to triple captain all or potential Julian uh, in that game because I think they're going to get absolutely battered if uh, you know Iriola Ira- isn't even gone by then because that's definitely an option. Um, so for sure, I think yeah, it's got to be the city option there. Um, and shall we see what the final one? Oh, there are a lot of tasty options there. Uh, Brighton at home against Sheffield. Arsenal with Burnley. Um, there are some decent options. I, I like Man United against Luton, but I don't trust Man United for shit currently. I think Aston Villa at home to Fulham could be also a big spanking. So if Ollie Watkins is keeping its form and Diaby's looking good too, those are some realistic options there. Um yeah, Saka, depending on um, how he's looking as well. Um, at home against Burnley, that looks decent. Brighton too, but if I were to pick one absolute standout captain, I think I'll go with uh, Ollie Watkins at, against Fulham. I think Fulham have been terrible this season and have looked shit. Yes, Lano is Lano, but uh, nah, man. I think... Uh, Aston Villa will be in the group by then, but considering the sort of this is these are the matches that they have to be winning because this is the as easy as it gets. Yeah, I think that's uh, quite a nice summary there. But I think it's also kind of, kind of interesting that the fact that you didn't really mention Salah and Holland that much at all does that open up the possibility from potentially going without either of them going forward, or do you think it's a must have to have both of them even if you don't really need to captain them any particular game week? I still think you have to go with them. Um, I just realized they were playing Brentford at home at Game Week 12. That makes Salah obviously a super tasty option. But it's just a question of um, when that Salah haul is coming. Like, we've got an 8-10 pointer here and 8 points and all this type of stuff. But we know he's capable of, like, 26 points. So yeah. when when is that coming? Is that coming against Brentford? Very likely, because Brentford are in a complete... A downwards trajectory and considering some of the matches that they have coming up I don't even think they're going to win a single one of them except for maybe Burnley on home I, I think they're going to lose against United I think they're going to lose against Chelsea and I think West Ham are going to probably get a point or even beat them and Liverpool away yeah forget it um, I was going to ask you about something else, but I can't quite remember what I was going to ask you. Uh, but yeah, uh, I think in general, just the Salah Holland thing. If you look at Liverpool, especially from game week nine until game week twelve, 
they have three out of the four matches are at home against really easy opposition, and then the final game is Luton away. So yeah, I think Salah is pretty much a no-brainer. I think it's more the fact you should consider potentially having another Liverpool asset, whether that is Trent defensively, which could also be an interesting option. He got an got a FPL assist just now for Gravenberch, uh, hitting the rebound uh, from a Trent Alexander-Arnold shot. Uh, or if you want to go with someone like Luis Diaz or Darwin, I think there are a lot of interesting Liverpool options. So I'm more likely to have two Liverpool assets than zero for this uh, this part of the the, the schedule, really. Um, when it comes to Man City, also question mark, how many City assets do you want to go with? We all we both uh, backed Alvarez in the, in the past, and we both rate him really highly, and I think we're both looking to just keep him for the foreseeable future as well. Um, so I think he's a really interesting option. So if you had a Walker right now, would you still keep Alvarez, or would you ship him out and only have Holland, uh, potentially? Like, what would you do in terms of the strikers, do you think? Even though I just slated the manager of the week, I do what the manager of the week did because I'm a crazy asshole and get rid of Holland. But realistically, obviously, it'd be Alvarez because that is an easy getaway uh, towards potentially a uh, Darwin, Watkins, and some of those combinations. Because, yes, um, I think I love Alvarez, but if you if you look at the fixtures, especially Watkins with the next uh, from game of eight to 12, it's hard to ignore him. Whilst I think City's Bournemouth game is super delicious and stuff like that, I just think Luton at home, West Ham at home, Fulham at home, Wolves away and Northern Forest away, it's just too good to ignore. Yeah, for me, I think I have a lot of value spent on uh, on Alvarez, I, and it's also a bit cheaper than all the other attacking options. But I think, personally, I think if I was on a wild card, I'd go towards a three forward type of option, uh, so like a three four three formation rather than a three five two formation, because I think there are a lot of good attacking assets. Like we said, Watkins, Aston Villa are second highest on the list, really easy fixtures. Man United with Hoyland, I think he looks really good as well. He's also one of the cheaper options, so it's pretty close to the same price as Alvarez. In Liverpool, you have Darwin Nunez. If he gets to start now, especially if he impresses against Brighton when he gets the chance with the Gakpo injured and, uh, and Jota suspended, he could definitely kick on. And if he starts playing regularly, I think Darwin is going to be pretty close to essential eventually if he starts playing regularly, that is. And then you also have like the other option from Game Week 10 with uh, Gabriel Jesus, because before the season, a lot of people were looking to double up on Saka and Jesus. But then he got injured, and then people went away from that. They double up on Martinelli instead, which didn't really work out because Martinelli has had like a tough start to the season, and now he's injured as well. But he's also making his way back, so he could potentially become an option as well. I think Arsenal are a really interesting pick from Game Week 10 onwards because I think both Game Week 10 and Game Week 12, you could potentially have the best captain's option in Saka. That also means that guys like Martinelli and Gabriel Jesus and potentially Martin Odegaard as well are also really good options and potentially also Gabriel in defense so I think Arsenal are kind of getting a bit overlooked obviously on a wild card for game of eight most people are going to look away from them because they have Man City coming up and then Chelsea away as well uh, but I think especially if you're wild card in game of 10 you can get a pretty big advantage from going with Arsenal players uh, going really hard Arsenal heavy potentially even tripling up on Arsenal could be the way to go and Brighton as well I think there are several reasons to go with a wild card in game of, uh, game of 10 rather than game of eight because both Brighton and Arsenal are potentially really good teams that could have really good players going forward from those points uh, moving forward. But yeah, that's pretty much the, the fixture ticker talk. A lot of interesting uh, teams, I think, on this list and a lot of good teams towards the top of the list as well. So I really understand why people are doing the wild card because yeah, if you don't have Spurs, Villa, Man United, or Man United maybe not, but Spurs, Villa and Liverpool players especially and Newcastle players as well, then a wild card is probably on the cards. Meanwhile, teams like teams that have been popular so far, Brentford, Man City, Chelsea, um, maybe it's time to get rid of those uh, those guys as well, as we've we've talked about here. Uh, but yeah, that's pretty much the fixture ticker talk. But speaking of having a wild card and, and choosing your team, uh, I always do the weekly wildcard drafts each and every week, and this week in particular has been pretty popular in terms of uh, a lot of people looking for a new team, a new wildcard team. So this is what I've come up with this week. I've had five players drop out, five players come in. Uh, and yes, I do have the triple up on uh, on Spurs. I also have the triple up on Aston Villa here with Diaby. This was made before the Diaby injury news, but he is still a really good option, I think. But you could have a placeholder like, uh, for example, for example, Jared Bowen here, um, if you don't want to if you don't want to risk it with Diaby's injury. 
Um, but yeah, this is basically the team that I gone with, and for the first time, I actually have someone else than Holland as the number one pick as well. Holland is actually the number three pick because I think Son and Salah are kind of more essential than Holland currently. But I think having all three is pretty important. That's why I have them as the number two, number three, and number four, or one number one, number two, and number two, three pick in this draft. Um, the Albi would obviously drop down a bit because of the injury, but yeah. I think tripling up on Aston Villa, tripling up on, on Spurs, as we've seen with the fixtures, I think that's a good idea, potentially. Watkins, I've kind of, since I made this, I've been sort of more, because I like I said uh, just now, I think there are so many good striker options. And, for example, Darwin, I think having Darwin and then potentially going to someone like Hoedlund or potentially Gabriel Jesus is also an option. So, so I'm not maybe 100% sold on Watkins. I think Watkins is also... You could like be fooled to think that he is like a really explosive player, but as you remember last season, he mostly just got one goal or one assist each game, pretty consistently, and that was it. He had that one explosion against Newcastle of all teams, but other than that, he was just pretty consistently just getting one goal here, one assist there, and getting points that way. So, I think there could potentially be some better explosive options, especially if you have Diaby as well. Uh, you don't need to double up on uh, on the Aston Villa attack because yeah we have, have seen so far this season that doubling up is kind of risky at some points with certain teams but yeah in general what do you think about this team and uh, the players that I've added are there any players that you feel like are missing from this team and are there any players you feel like are in this team that probably shouldn't be there like what do you think about this team in general yeah generally speaking I think this is one of the ones where I can't really fault the decisions or, you know, um, I'll be like, oh, there's a, a blaring uh, omission. I mean, obviously the one blaring omission is the fact that you have zero Man United players, even though they have a pretty decent um, run of fixtures, but I can't fault you for that, considering someone who has Bruno Fernandes, fuck Man United. So, um, yeah, uh, that being said, can't really fault it. I, I really uh, admire the pick of Brantwaite, especially considering the fact that he's about to get a new contract as well. So kudos on you. And finally, my brother, Bernino, has been recognized. So nice to see uh, as well. Um, but other than that, super template, super perfect, very easy for the fixtures coming up ahead. So can't really fault it. So no, no players in particular you're missing. Who's the one player you would add if you if you could to this team? Okay, as a joker, just <laughs> like a play, just a, and this is serious. This is not me uh, trolling yeah. like outside I usually do. Like an outside pick, I think Rasmus Sagan. Then seriously, yeah. I think I've been very impressed with what I've seen of him, and I think mm-hmm. he's up hundred percent going to start um, taking points away from Rashford because he is clearly their number one striker and everything like that. And Rashford has been very um, effective in getting uh, Hayland involved in the attack and et cetera. They have a really good combination play, which uh, has been interesting to watch. Um, so I think Hayland's actually serious contention for as a joke, uh, as a joker pick. Um, obviously the fact that you don't have a Saka or Edgar could come back to haunt you um, yeah. in terms of a weekly wild card, especially if Sock is out. I think Odegaard's penalty potential and all this type of stuff, he, he he will carry the team because he's shown that, you know, he's a little bit of a one-man army when he has to be. So I think that might be the only glaring omission. Uh, but in terms of the fixtures and everything and how it's lined up, this is as good as it gets. Fair enough. I, I like those picks as well. I, I have thought about those guys as well. I think Arsenal in general are, are going to be really good. And I think Hoyland is also a really underrated pick. I know a lot of people are souring on many United prospects in general, but he looked really amazing against Galatasaray scoring two goals and having one goal disallowed as well. Really nice disallowed goal. He was slightly offside uh, beforehand, yeah. but really good composure to just keep the ball really like quick and easy, easy decision there to go past the player and just shoot it into the goal. So... Uh, yeah, I really like Hoyland as well. It's just, I'm just so invested in Alvarez. Uh, and I really like Alvarez. We both like Alvarez quite a lot, so that's why we're going for him. But speaking of Alvarez and your current plans, that's one of the things that stood out to me on your free hit team. You actually kept Alvarez against Arsenal, because I think Alvarez is a good hold in general going forward, but against Arsenal away, that's kind of the fixture where I think he might struggle. But you did say in the fixture results, like the predictions, that you do kind of back him to be like the deciding factor in that game 
So what do you make of the Alvarez thing? Is he like one of the players you might potentially sell? Because you have, I have listed, or there are some players listed here, Richardson, Darwin, and Hoylin, that I think are interesting shouts for this game week. Um, is Alvarez one of the players you're thinking of selling, or or what is like the main like dilemmas that you have on your free hit? And while you're talking, I'm going to get my charger because I need to charge my PC. So, so yeah, just speak while I'm gone, and I'll be back pretty soon. So the thinking here is essentially that with Holon, the reason why I want to keep him is he is obviously Holon. He has the penalty taking abilities as well, which I definitely think the Arsenal could commit at home. Um, but I am willing to completely get rid of Holon and Alvarez simply because I think the potentials of Hayden and Darwin are higher in terms of the fact that I think these games are a bit more one-sided compared to the Arsenal uh, away match. So those are the reasons why I consider maybe even getting rid of both of them. Um, but that being said, I know what I've said about Alvarez. I still I still believe that. And I think that he might stay in the team and same with Holland because I do not want to miss out in case they haul and in case they get easy pens or whatever it may be. But I am 100% considering just getting rid of both and just getting Hoyland and Darwin and just having fun with this free hit because partially this is me also getting a bunch of players that I don't have don't have the capacity of getting unless I do a bunch of minus moves because I have so many other players who, and so many blaring omissions with injuries and um, in Gordon's uh, case of a suspension. So, yeah. I think I could see myself having fun because I'm also considering maybe even having Sterling over Bruno, but I think Bruno should be the one to explode against Brentford. It seems like a Bruno sort of game. But other than that, I actually think um, Calvert-Lewin is the most nailed-on player I have. I think uh, I think the game against Bournemouth and his current form just deserves it. I think he's been fantastic. And I think in FPL for 5.8, pretty decent shout just generally speaking as a third option if you can't afford the Alvarez or Watkins of the world yeah I quite like that shout as well um even though I would potentially because I I really like Darwin and Hoyland so I think I might try to bring in both of those guys but I can't fault really the the Calvert Loon shout either it's just the fact that he is slightly like injury prone still and Beto might also play if if Beto doesn't start the game alongside Calvert Lewin, I could easily see Calvert Lewin being replaced by Beto and Calvert Lewin playing in about seventy minutes or so. Um, but yeah, I do like the pick. I think it's a nice like outside pick, and you should have some fun on a free hit as well. And that's kind of like the thing. Uh, I think I think you've sort of done a bit of like downside protection. You're sort of protecting yourself in case the whole the city assets haul or in case Bruno Fernandes. You kind of don't want to lose out on Bruno Fernandes points now that you've stuck with him for so long. I sort of get that as well. And speaking from experience, you could also like do too many changes on a free hit. Two seasons ago, I did a free hit uh, in a game week where I actually removed Salah because he was facing Man United. And as we know, with Salah against Man United, he tends to score. This was not the 7-0 game last uh, season, but he did score potentially even a hat-trick, I think, two seasons ago against Man United. Um, so yeah, I free hated him, him out, and a lot of other people had him in the squad. So I actually lost points from doing the free hit. So it's definitely a, a warning sign uh, to, to like remove players like Holland, for example. But I think I don't know doubling up on on City assets against Arsenal away. Personally, I don't think I would do it. But I think, like you said, you're sort of annoyed already from not backing Alvarez earlier in the season. Uh, so I sort of get why you've picked him, but at the same time. I think there could be some some better options there in, in potentially Darwin or Hoyland, but that's pretty much the only thing I could say about this team that I don't really like. The triple up on Spurs makes a lot of sense. You could potentially go with Richarlison as like a, a sentimental pick because you're an Everton fan and you have a lot of good feelings to Richarlison, but I think also this is a, this is a fixture that really suits Madison as well. And Son, you, you basically has, have to have because he's going to be the most popular captain's option as well. Uh, but yeah, speaking of captaincy, that's the only other thing I want to talk about as well. Um, you have Son as captain, but are you considering Salah at any point, or is it basically just Son or bust, pretty much? I kind of want to see how he does in this game. He's He should have already had an assist, and he already should have had a goal as well. Yeah. He missed the 
or the goalkeeper did a decent save for the one-on-one, but he really should have buried it. So I think that will also influence me a little bit. Um, But I think it's just because, yes, if I hadn't free hit, I would have done probably Salah as my captain because I... I would have had to go on minus four, or even minus eight to bring in Son. So for me, I think um, there's a reason why he is my vice captain, right? Because I did consider it, but I'm going to wait. I'm going to wait, give it another day, I guess, because this is it's Thursday and obviously <laughs> the league resumes soon. So I'm going to have to take some, be a bit quick with my decision making, but I think it's got to be Son just because it is going to be the one who's going to be captain the most. And if he bangs, then I'm going to look like a real asshole if I pick someone else. Yeah. Son is also now speaking on Thursday, which we're recording that they were recording at. He's back in training. He hasn't been training earlier in this week. He has struggled a bit with injuries. So I would also like take note of whatever uh, Postokogu says in his uh, press conferences. Because if Son plays only 70 minutes, then Salah plays 90. I personally think Salah is a better option, but... I don't know. Son has been subbed off pretty early in most games, and that's my only issue with Son. I'm not sure if he's going to play the whole match, and Salah, I think, has a really good fixture that could potentially be a major win for Liverpool as well, but we know Brighton kind of play better against these top sides as well, the Serbi. It's really hard to predict Brighton, I think, because, yeah, the Serbi has proven that he can beat anyone, and he can also all of a sudden lose like (laughs) 6-1 like he did now. Uh, like he did Everton last season as well with 5-1 um, so yeah I think it's a really interesting captaincy debate here between Salah and Son but it seems like Son is going to be the most popular captaincy option it seems like Son is about captain by about like 60-65% and Salah is about like 20-25% and then the rest is like some on Holland some go with the punt on a different guy um, but yeah I think the captaincy thing is is pretty interesting but in general I think yeah, your free team is, is pretty pretty damn good if I may say so myself uh, triple Spurs makes all the sense in the world. Uh, you have Salah, who's a must-have, I think. Fernandez also, since you have the money to to bring him in, I think this is still a good uh, good fixture for him. So I don't really fault that. But downgrading him to upgrade the striker options, uh, potentially upgrading Alvarez, potentially, I think that would might be the the move that I I might look to to make. Uh, and also, you could also have the, the discussion between having Ducore and Hoylen or. Fernandes and Calvert-Lewin but I think the pen takers is always the, the easy thing to go with there and Bruno Fernandes and Calvert-Lewin are both on pens so it makes more sense for me as well for your team so in general I, I really kind of rate your free hit team I think it makes sense for your team as well I don't fault anyone using the free hit when they're in the position that you were in we had no Spurs assets and you had so many red and orange flags and yellow flags and all that stuff so I think it's the right decision for you to free hit. I probably should have free hit last game week because the free hit team that I sent to you actually would have gotten like 50 more points or something than my own team. So, so yeah, I think it's a good decision for you to free hit, even though normally I would say like, oh, typical Kevin doing just something to, to have fun. But I think it makes a lot of sense for you. So, so yeah, I think it's uh, well done from you, both in terms of using the free hit and the team that you've landed on as well. So, so yeah, hoping it works out for you because uh, I think it's a fun team to, to watch. But we have another guy who has used the chip this game week, and that is Kimo. He has used his wildcard, and this is the team that he currently has. Um, he has Turner Ariola, which is really a template. The defensive line is also pretty template. I guess like Trippier is sort of like the the decision that a lot of people will have to make whether they want to include Trippier or not. The one thing that is not template for Kimo is the fact that he doesn't have Sala uh, currently. And you said that at the start of this uh, this episode, you are questioning his. Uh, his Egyptian, uh, I don't know, credentials if he doesn't have Salah. Yet again, he sold Salah a couple of game weeks ago. And going without Salah on, on a wild card, I don't think it's advisable at all. I had him as the number two most important pick to have. Uh, and Salah's not even in this team, so I think that's kind of crazy, uh, personally. And I don't really see the upside to not having him either. I guess it's adding both Watkins and Trippier to his team. I think that's maybe the 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 benefit that he gets because he has Son, Madison, Holland, and then Watkins and Trippier as well. It's quite expensive, um, so yeah. I think that's the same route you're going with. No Salah, no Saka, and really no good way of getting them. He does have one million in the bank, I think, 
um, on this wildcard. But yeah, uh, what do you think about the wildcard in general? What do you think about the no Salah thing? And how would you go about getting Salah into the squad if you were Kimo? How are you doing, Kimo? That's all I have to say. Um, I think it's, like we've always said, it's much easier to downgrade from Salah than it is to try and desperately sell everyone to try and get him. So I think, especially in that wildcard scenario where it's easier to plan these sort of things, just have Salah from the get-go and build from there. That's, that is my biggest advice to him and i think it's uh, a bit lunacy it, there's a bit of lunacy here and not having him and uh you know i guess yeah he hates man united and that's why he doesn't trust them and that's why he doesn't have a single united player as well even though their fixtures do turn um so i would reconsider things massively because i think going without salah this far has probably cost him as well because i think he would have done even better if he had Salah in some, certain scenarios, but it's going to cost him definitely infinitely more going forward because now is when Liverpool's fixtures are even more favorable. So what the hell are you doing, man? That's all I can say. Yeah. I like, I like a lot of the picks that he's done. Otherwise I think, um, you know, uh, Huang Hee Chan is a fun little outside pick, obviously burn lamb tea. Um, and some of these other guys, Bo and Diaby, and all the sort of guys that you want to see, but um, yeah, man, you can't go without Salah. And I also think that him eventually going without um, Saka could also cost him. Yeah, he he loves Saka too, so it's a I understand it's a tough position to be in, especially considering we don't really know the extent of his injury. Some people try to claim that's not going to be that long and then other people try to claim that it's longer and all this type of stuff so i understand the uncertainty about it but no man you have to have Salah if you're doing a wild card i think it has to go with Salah involved yeah he did provide a Salah team as well uh, on in the group chat and the differences here is that he has to remove Trippier who made a really strong case uh, against uh, like we discussed, me and Kimo discussed uh, Trippier, but he'd have to remove Trippier and he'd add uh, Joachim Andersen from Crystal Palace for 4.8. Yeah. He would remove Bowen to get Salah. That would be his way to get Salah. He'd also downgrade Huang Hei Chan down to Andersen just to save some money there. And he'd also downgrade Watkins to Darwin, which saves him a bit more money as well. So that is pretty much the th- main differences from his Salah team to his non-Salah team. So do you think you prefer that team? Basically, Trippier to Anderson, Bowen to Salah, Watkins to Darwin, and Huang to Anderson. Yeah, I, I think uh, I think in the end, yeah, I, I do prefer it simply because Salah and um, yeah, Salah is super essential, and he already has Son. So in terms of like the weekly wild card sort of draft rankings and stuff like that he's got the most essential players so yeah man i think it's uh it's got to be done yeah i also back his solid team over this team but but yeah it comes down to Trippier and watkins basically how much stock are you going to put into them after their really good performances as of late that's pretty much the decision you have to make if you want to go with Salah or not because i don't really see any other way of getting Salah. you, you sort of have to downgrade Trippier at least to get the money for yeah. for Salah, or you'd have to go from from Madison to someone. But I know Kimo loves Madison; he's never going to drop Madison. Um, so yeah, it's hard to do without dropping Trippier. I think having Salah Son and Holland. Um, so I think that is something that he, he sort of has to to do. But that team would also have zero point zero in the bank. So again, no easy way of getting Saka with this team. He could actually go from Madison to Saka if he wanted to. Potentially even Bowen to Saka as well. He'd be pretty close to doing in game week 10 um so i think that is sort of a plus to not having salah that you could potentially get Saka as well on top of son holland madison potentially and trip here uh but yeah i th- also think it's it's sort of lunacy to go without salah even though i don't think he hasn't re- he has really lost out much from salah because he did bank this game week and he, while salah got 10 points the game week before so did plenty other midfield assets including madison and son who got a lot of points so 
So yeah, I don't think the solid move was too bad for Freaky Mool the past few game weeks, but I think he definitely needs him back now for the great fixture run. So yeah, those are pretty much our, our thoughts on Kimo's team. I think his solid team is better than, than this one as well. But, uh, but yeah, those are pretty much my thoughts. It's just a matter of Trippier or not. I think Kimo's pretty sold on Trippier after seeing him against Newcastle. He got an assist and was involved in quite a lot of uh, attacking uh, output from, from Newcastle in that really impressive win against uh, PSG. But let's move on to the final person that we're going to talk about and that is the manager of the week Jacob and his uh, his team he actually has 2.2 in the bank so I think he has some sort of idea on what to do and my predicted transfer or potential transfer here is basically doing Morris to, to Darwin Nunez upgrading Morris who he had for the double game week I think like if I'm trying to get into this guy's head I think that's why he has 2.2 million in the bank he wanted Morris for that double game week and then he's going to have money in the bank to upgrade him and I think Darwin is one of the options he can go with, I don't think he has enough money for, for Watkins. Uh, but obviously Hoyland is the other option as well. Um, do you back this same transfer? Do you think that's his idea? Or do you think he has the money in the bank because he wants to get Holland back eventually? Like, What would you look to do with this team? You obviously have Robertson as well, who costs a lot of, a lot of money in defense. So it's not going to be as viable as a pick now that Trent is back. So would you try to get Holland within the next two or three game weeks? Or would you just go without Holland and, and maximize your team for now with Darwin and stuff? Like, what would be your strategy, do you think, if you were in this guy's shoes? I mean, if you're already committed to it, it seems a uh, complete uh, wild card. Um, own goals to essentially try and go back for Holland. So if you're going to commit to this lunacy, you might as well do a simple move like Darwin, who isn't a sideways move at all, especially if it's confirmed that he's going to pretty much play striker all the time especially with Jota's um big card and uh, etc so um yeah I think it's worth the shout to just do this move because I don't think Morris is worth having besides the double game week and he, he got his 10 point return from him just to say salute and uh get Darwin in who has more favorable matches going forward anyways or potentially looking into Maybe a cheeky Rasmus Island or something like that if he want, really wants to uh, go with this asshole um, uh, differential team that he's going with. I'm sorry, I'm not calling you an asshole, but it's just, it's just, I think it's a very, very uh, joker thing to do to um, get rid of Holland, who we know is capable of absolutely destroying any team at any second. So, yeah. You don't want to fall behind, and uh, kudos to you if it works. Yeah, I think it's also a really interesting strategy, and this guy's actually done really well so far. I think he's like number 10 overall in the league. He has about 30 or 40 points more than me as well. So, so yeah, he's he's done pretty well so far, so so maybe he's onto something with the no hole on thing. But personally, I would not do it myself. But, but yeah, I think, like you said, he has committed to it, and I think he has a plan with the money in the bank. So, so yeah, hopefully he has a, has a plan, but... Yeah, bringing Darwin in for Morris. Obviously, Morris is on the bench, so you'd have to sub Darwin in. I'd probably bench Robertson if uh, everyone else is fit, but you also have the Diaby thing. If Diaby is out, then, then he's obviously a person you could easily bench as well. He also has Gordon. I don't think he's suspected Gordon to be suspended either for this game. Um, so that's uh, something that he can fix uh, eventually as well. As well. Also, interesting shot with uh, Martinez and goal, I think. Um, but, but yeah, Aston Villa have some pretty good fixtures, but it doesn't have cash, which is also kind of kind of interesting. So could potentially also do Robertson to cash um, if you don't want to do the Darwin move. Uh, but I also th I also think it's interesting. Robertson is that he's so close to price in terms of uh, matching the same price as Trent Alexander Arnold. So that's also a different differential you can go with. If I didn't have Holland myself, that's probably someone that I would try to get into my team. Having Trent for for the next few game weeks, really will have really good fixtures. Could be a really fun differential that could work out compared to compared to Holland, but yeah, like you said, going without Holland, I wouldn't do it myself. But you sort of have to commit to the bits, and uh, and yeah, it will be interesting to see how this uh, team ends up and if it becomes manager of the week in a different week. And yeah, like I said previously in the podcast, if uh, anyone watching wants to be manager of the week, you can join the mini league. You can see the league code above me right here again: V nine J T zero D. Please join us if uh, if you if you can, and please subscribe if you haven't already be really nice trying to hit a uh, thousand subscribers at least before the end of the year 
and kick on from there and get the 10k subscribe the subscribers before then start the next season hopefully but yeah we'll see either way thank you for this uh, podcast kevin that has uh, been it for now and um, as always i'm gonna leave it the last word to you what do you have to say for yourself kevin yo man fuck bournemouth if we don't win that game uh sack sean dice <laughs>